You're listening to the We Love Equity Real Estate Show, a podcast that discusses the intricacies of real estate investing with your host, Marcus E. Maloney. Marcus is a real estate investor best known for being the equity king. He's been awarded that moniker because he and his team find amazing real estate deals. He will be talking with investors who have done some transformational things in the real estate industry. They'll discuss their process, their strategies, and how their investments transform their lives and the communities they invest in. We welcome you to the We Love Equity Real Estate Show. That was the best partnership I've ever had because he needed something I had, I needed something he had. And then again, we were able to communicate and conflict comes up. I saw it this way, you saw it that way. Jerry was very good at writing things down. He's like, what? It's not my intent to do this or your intent to do that, but we forget we forget things. So let's make sure we write it down. So say in six months, it's not that we're trying to cheat or take each other's deals or steal stuff, but let's make sure we doc, write everything down. The We Love Equity Show is brought to you by Azria. Widely recognized as an outstanding resource for real estate investors with exceptional education, networking, and support, along with profit-enhancing benefits and all aspects of real estate investing. Visit Asria at www.asria.org. That's visit Asria at www.azreia.org. We love Equity Family. Welcome to another episode. Welcome to another show. On today, I got some home cooking going on right here. I have Philip Zweig from right here in sunny Southwest Arizona. He hails from the Phoenix metro area. Specifically, if you guys are from, from Arizona, he's in Chandler. So he's doing quite a few things here in the Arizona market. He has been doing he has been an investor for over 22 years. So this guy has some longevity. He's done over a thousand deals. He has done wholesale deals, fix and flip, uh, has a rental portfolio, and now getting into the uh, Airbnb, Airbnb and short-term rental space. So guys, we want to welcome Philip Zweig to the show. Philip, welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes, thank you. All right. So Philip, getting started, man, I, I was reading your backstory. I know that you were in, in corporate USA. What pulled you out of corporate and decided to go out on your own, basically? Well, I so, right out of college, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I ended up getting an <laughs> internship with Xerox selling uh, photocopiers. Did that for about two years. And door-to-door -door sales, bro, teaches you a ton of stuff. So... Yeah, and, and what the door to door sales is is completely scary, dude. And I mean, yeah. but in this space of real estate, I mean, it really helps you out. So I'm I'm pretty sure that helped you out quite a bit. Oh man, I like for me in the beginning, I would just like be terrified. But then you get used to getting rejected, and uh, like I would just collect business cards and go meet folks and just look at that way. And so I did real well there, but like, I wasn't happy with just selling photocopiers. So I went over to the campus at ASU where I graduated and uh, went into the career center. And I wanted to get with the program that did more sales training than I was getting where I was at. So I got with a company called Automatic Data Processing. It's a fortune 100 company they do payroll they do taxes software so i got in there it was very competitive i had like six interviews got the job sat on the bench for actually six months behind the experienced sales rep then i got my territory in south phoenix industrial space did it for five years but i i met a guy there marcus charles who was from michigan midwest guy and he was older, working, Not he was still hitting his numbers at ADP, but he had some other things going on. And one of the things he was doing is real estate and he was he had a rental portfolio. So he, he was kind of my first mentor other than I picked up some late night v videos. 
Who hasn't, <laughs> Phil? <laughs> I forget that guy on TV, uh, but that was I, – I bought those videos. But, yeah, so then I had Charles there, and it, 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 it kind of changed the direction of my thinking. And I saw guys getting fired at corporate America because a new sales exec would come in, maybe didn't like the way you talked or looked. And I was like, man, I, I don't want to devote all my, you know, energy and maybe someone doesn't like me and they'll fire me so i'm like i i gotta figure something else out and also time freedom marcus like i knew i wanted children to coach to volunteer so i i i made the jump like five years after working that job and thank god i did it's been quite the ride okay because i know in corporate america man so let me ask you this so you were doing sales and guys you see, I'm wearing a Yankees hat. He's wearing an NYC hat. We're not from New York. But the funny thing about it is we're actually both from Chicago land, not knowing, but somehow we're, we're rocking uh, NYC today. <laughs> and it wasn't planned, believe me. So being from the Midwest and transitioning here to the Southwest, you went to ASU and you, you got that corporate job and you were working that and you found this mentor. What was that first step like? jumping out there on your own because that's one of the things that people that's one of the things that stop people is the fear of can i really bet on myself and get out here and do this and be able to sustain myself how did you overcome that fear in doing that like you said marcus it's all about numbers in corporate america so like adp is especially like we'd have meeting after meeting quotas and I would always hit those but like man I create more pressure on myself than that that pressure so I liked working at corporate for a number of reasons I had good credit I was able to show that I had a w2 so what I was able to do from there is buy my first town home and get that in Chandler from there, I ended up living there for like six months. I got a property in Scottsdale, and I didn't know it was called uh, house hacking, but I rented, I bought a property up in Scottsdale, and then I rented out three of the rooms at the time to young professionals, and like my mortgage was zero because they were paying my mortgage down. So I just, home ownership to me was the first step, and um then that rental property. And so, then so Philip, before we, before we go all the way into your journey, when okay. you got that first place and you didn't know what house hacking was, what made you think that, okay, I'll buy this place and then I'll rent it out. I'll rent it out by the room. How old were you at that time? I must've been mid twenties. Yeah. And I was working at ADP, the payroll service and, I, I'm like, man, this is a good size house. I got, it was a four bedroom and my mortgage, I think was like $1,200 or something at the time. So I charged a guy like three, 400 for the big room, whatever. But yeah, that worked beautiful and did that for about a year and a half and everyone was, loved it. So that, yeah, that was really my first step is home ownership and because I had, through college, always rented or shared rooms mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So that was exciting to know that, hey, man, I could actually own. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so did you find that just like through traditional means, through a realtor, MLS, so on and so forth? The first one, so Charles was dealing with a guy in Gilbert, actually. And, man, it was like... I came out to Gilbert, there was nothing. There was like horses <laughs> on the wall, cow pictures. So the first realtor, he his name was Chuck, and he, he did a lot of HUD and for, pre-foreclosure stuff like that back in that day. So that first one was through him, and that was the one that I bought in Chandler, and then I ended up renting it and moving to Scottsdale. So that was the very first one. But yeah, those were more like, I mean, they were probably weren't great deals. They were just probably more retail stuff, but it got me into yeah. about buying, buy, being an owner. 
And it, it, it got you going. And that's what I tell a lot of people is just get your foot in the door. Just get started. If you got to start traditionally by buying something on an MLS and house hacking like you did, even if it's a condo, hey, I take one, one room and rent out the other room. That's what you got to do in order to get started. Because what it does is, like you said, that frame of mind start getting you to thinking, hey, I can use this property as an income generating asset versus just a liability because most people don't believe that a home is a liability. So it's just that that whole frame of mind. So you did that property, you got that going. How did you end up doing more deals over time? Because I know we, we're going to talk about the crash in 08 and 09 and how that affected you. But what did you end up building up to before that crash happened? Okay. So yeah, with once I got that rental in Chandler, I moved to Scottsdale. I didn't last too much longer in corporate America because I had the itch to like, all right, my manager that I loved, he, he transferred to San Diego and my teammate was now my manager. We have new sales execs. So a lot of a lot of politics in corporate, of course. So I decided to give it another six months. I had saved for I, I I'm pretty frugal. So I had saved 30, 40 grand from 401ks to whatever. So I gave it six months and then I, I decided to just leave ADP and I was looking for a fix and flip. And I found it. I left corporate America. My parents were not happy. They view it, I guess, as a safe, secure job. You got, you got a good salary, plus you get commissions. So at that time, this is 20 some years ago, there wasn't a lot of guys out there flipping properties. So like, is it legal? Is it what? Yeah. So man, I, like I said, I had about 40 grand, I think saved from stocks and 401k and i i actually got penalized because i cashed it out to, to do my first fix and flip but that's what i wanted to do the first years i would say were not easy they it was a struggle but i was like happy to get into that first fix and flip deal i made so so philip what were, what were some of those struggles because people believe okay i'm gonna leave my job I have $40,000 to try and get started. That's to some people, that's everything. That's, that's the most money they've ever touched or they haven't even touched that much. So what were some of those setbacks? Because again, people make it seem to be so easy and so grand and you just find a property, put $20,000 yeah. into it. I mean, I, with Charles, my mentor, he only did like rental portfolios. So he could only teach me so much. Yeah, I need a handyman to fix the sink or whatever. So I, the hardest part I'd say, Charles, was finding the people to renovate the house, knowing what, what the heck do I do? Like, I don't have a construction background. I'm not that handy. So how do I learn this? And the only way I had to learn it was through like jumping in and figuring it out. Like what I, how do I do this? And maybe the person would show up to check out the roof. Like maybe he'd give me this quote. I had no idea, just read some books, but like I didn't know what a, a Phoenix roof would cost to, to replace on a 1965 house. And I just, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's, that's back then we didn't have all of the resources that we have now. I mean, we have meetup groups, we have pockets, we have YouTube videos, podcasts such as this, and you're on Instagram, things like that. Now it's, it seemed like it's a lot easier, but at some point you just got to jump in and learn, like you said, that trial by fire. And that's how you start learning what the costs are and everything like that. So you got this property, Philip, and you're 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 having these headaches. What did you end up? And I know this is 22 years ago. What did you end up picking that property up for? How did you find it? And how did you dispo it? So I I forget what book I read, but like so even I was an investor, right? So I had the one Chandler property that I owned. So one of the things I had to do is assemble a team of people around me to help me. So 
I needed a private money lender. I needed a title company. I needed wholesale. Like wholesale wasn't anything like it is now, but like I, I, I went to all the, t- I made a list of like, all right, I got to call so many people today. I actually got to go in and talk to the title company. I got to say that I am an investor because I had one property. So I guess I wasn't making it up. I, I'm an investor. I own a rental. So that's where I started. And so I, I met a security title company up there in Scottsdale where I was living at the time. And so the Overfields, they introduced me to a lady named Monica, who was a realtor up in Paradise Valley. And she also did lend out money of her doctor friends and people up there. So she gave me my first chance of a hard money loan. I, I didn't know what a hard money loan was. So she actually did that one. This property for viewers in other states, this is a Maryville Terrace, like 67th Avenue, Indian School, kind of a blue collar yep. neighborhood out there. So, man, I'm trying to think how I got that first house, but I just got into it and it was probably like 65000 or something, I'd say, back in the day. Okay. Um, needed a ton of work, built in the late 60s. And I would just call out of like new times, Craigslist, like, hey, you're a handyman, you're construction. You're like, so you don't know who's going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But you was, you was finding your way. And that's what's most important. Everybody's not going to have this master blueprint to follow. You have to find your way. Because even if you do have that master blueprint to follow and you say, hey, I got this great contractor, he may start work for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Something may happen detrimental in his family or something may happen to her family that's working on a property. Now you got to try and find somebody to to finish the work for you. So guys, you got to remember, just like Phil, you just got to get out there. You got to take the action. You got to get started. You can read so many books. You can listen to so many podcasts. You can watch so many Instagram videos and everything like that. But until you actually get out there and start meeting people, like Philip said, and get out from behind the computer and really get out there and start networking, that's when you're going to start finding that momentum and start building that momentum. So, Philip, let's kind of speed up. Let's kind of expedite things here. You did that deal. Was it a success for you? I mean, monetarily, probably not. I mean, it took a lot of, I don't know how many months it took, but I mean, I made like almost a thousand bucks. So Okay. In my brain, it, it was successful because I wasn't like, well, not that I ever clocked in corporate, but I wasn't like having to do quotas anymore. Like I was successful because I was free of the corporate stuff that goes with corporate. So to me, I felt great about it. I, I still at that time, like, man, can I pay the bills for my family? Can I get uh, a child on the way, a baby coming? So... It was still scary. So I yep. I didn't know what do I get a part-time job? Do I go back to corporate America? So it, it takes a while to get momentum. But so I ended up working part-time job from the home from the home. So that was awesome because I could devote most of the time to the real estate, but I had to do that to pay the SRP yep. collection bills or whatever. So so that so so guys that's that's good right there what Philip just said is that you're going to face that fear even after you do your first deal, second deal, third deal. Sometimes I still face some fear because I'm like okay, well what if this doesn't happen? What if that doesn't happen? Just a quick example, I just had a tenant, long-term tenant, just called me out of the blue and said, "Hey, can't pay rent anymore." And this was like my main cash flow and property. So I had to pick up and and really turn things around and get that property back on track so we can start getting that income coming in again because it's scary when you have properties that are not producing but you're still paying mortgages on them and oh, everything yeah. like that. So guys, don't think just because you get some properties under your belt and you do some deals that, that you're going to be able to let your hair down and take it easy. You still have to work. So Philip, you started building this portfolio, you started building 
your networking, your know-how, and then 2008, 2009 hits you. What happened during that span? Well, prior to that, I ended up, this is about 2004, I met a guy who's been a big influence in my life. So he started in real estate when he was 20. He actually retired when he was 50. And I'm like, man, I'd love to be that guy. And right. Be done at 50 and do whatever I want. Maybe travel for six months to, I don't know, wherever. And so I met Jerry. He was 65 years old in 2004. And he wanted to get back into real estate. He just moved out here from uh, Oregon. And he got referred from my hard money lender, Monica, to me. And he's like, yeah, I want to fix and flip. So I was wholesaling because I was really busy. I was wholesaling, I was flipping. And so I had this house in central Phoenix. And I, at the time I'm like, it's $10,000. I never met him. I'm like, $10,000 non-refundable. You sure you want it? He's like, yeah. So he gives me a check for 10 and he calls me, he's driving back to his home and he's like, Phil, my wife has these ideas and I have these ideas on the remodel. Just keep, keep my 10,000. I'm like, I'm not going to, I, I don't want anyone's 10,000. So I'm like, what, let me see what I can do. So I sold that house the next day. I made him 10,000. I made me like 10,000. So from that time on, we became business partners and wow, it was a great relationship because he had so much knowledge in real estate. And so I needed him as a partner too, because my business just triple or tenfold. When once him and I formed an LLC, he was the guy behind the computer. I was the guy in the streets. He, he had the capital. And then we ended up getting a, a million dollar bank line of credit together. So we used that for quite a while. So we bought, we were busy. We were doing eight, 10 deals a month, flipping, fixing, wholesale. And then four years later, we, we have 2008. So we had a lot of rentals under our belt. We put 30 year mortgages through these lending institutions and 2008, oh, that lender went under, that lender, nope. went under. we had homes on the market that were supposed to close that week. No, nope, that lender just, we'd hear on the radio driving down the 10. And so there was a lot of sleepless nights. And with all those rental portfolio we had, the banks wouldn't do anything for us. They did, they're like, you're an investor. It was like, we can't do a loan mod. We won't do this. We won't do that. So we ended up losing a lot of rental property we just gave it back to them and yeah so that was my retirement right there wow then. i was buying deep discount wholesale and even though i was buying it deep we still couldn't survive because the prices just fell Tanked. off the cliff yeah and jerry even with all his experience and knowledge he's like man i've been praying i've been sleep i can't sleep and we didn't know what to do. So we came to the conclusion, just let all that property go back. So, so let me ask you this, Philip, because I don't want to gloss over this. The power of partnership. So you were referred to this guy and you guys teamed up and you started basically a power couple. You guys started working together. How did you build that trust with him? How did he build that trust with you? And, and how important is partnership in your eyes? Oh, my goodness. Bro, that was, it was amazing. So, I mean, that was the best partnership I've ever had because he needed something I had. I needed something he had. And then, again, we were able to communicate and conflict comes up. I saw it this way. You saw it that way. Jerry was very good at writing things down. He's like, what? It's not my intent to do this or your intent to do that, but we forget we forget things. So let's make sure we write it down. So say in six months, it's not that we're trying to cheat or take each other's deals or steal stuff, but let's make sure we dot, write everything down. So like, yeah, we, we had some, uh, a few, I mean, again, when you have a partnership, you have things that come up. Oh, I saw it that way. I saw it that way. We are always able to work through it mainly from Jerry because he's been through it. And he taught me that we, just because we 
saw it differently doesn't mean you're right or wrong. It's just right. Like, let's talk about it. Okay. So in 2008, 2009, did you guys dissolve the partnership or did you just kind of take a hiatus? Um, no, we, yes. So we ended up, we had to just liquidate, get, I mean, give back all that rental property. So yeah, 2009, we ended up dissolving the LLC. So man, I, I was like, cool. Cause we had, 20% cash on all these properties too. So we not only lost cash, we lost a lot of uh, assets. So yeah. Um, yeah. And that built in baked in equity that you guys thought you had when yeah. you were buying it at a discount. Yeah. So for like three, four months there, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm used to X amount of, you know, income every month. And now like not even, I, I can't even get a, a job and make, 12 bucks. I, I don't know what to do. So like the only thing I could think of was I don't want to change because this is all I know, all I love. So it was about three months later, someone again introduced me to someone. I met two Canadian women who actually were teaching Canadians how to invest in the United States. So for three years, I would get all their students coming to Arizona. I would be the guy. I would find them property in Levine. I'd find them properties all over that they can invest in. So they had cash. Like I didn't have any money anymore. So I was like, I, I don't know. So I was able to mentor a lot of Canadians, probably a hundred and some Canadians over three year period. They did extremely well because they bought the properties were so cheap at that time. So, so how were you, how are you? I mean, that was, I mean, again, let's not gloss over the part, the, the power of partnership and the power of networking. You, you met this person that's working with Canadians. You're broke. You don't have anything. You're like, okay, well, what am I going to do next? And because of your relationships, that next opportunity popped up so how are you feel how are you how are you gaining any commissions off of those deals and things like that because were, were you a realtor i create like with working with jerry like we had our, like all our we did some sub twos we did some creative finance so like he taught like all his things were pretty simple writing contracts so i created like a consulting agreement or like I had the one, two page. I, it's very simple. Here's what we're going to do if you agree. And then also to work with me, I needed an upfront fee. Like I'm not going to work with you if you can't give me five or 10 grand up front, because I think usually it was 10 grand, but like they were very willing to pay it. So one Canadian talks to the other, they say, oh yeah, Phil's doing a good job. So those referrals were coming in too. And yeah, there was always a fee because like my time is, I'm going to make you a lot of money. So yeah, I would just create my own consulting agreements. Okay. Okay. Well, that was great. I mean, it, 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 it sustains you until you got back to where you needed to be. And I yeah. mean, $10,000 consulting fee, that's not, that's not bad work. So what all did you do for them feel? So here's the thing. So some of them wanted rentals, Marcus. Some of them wanted to learn fix and flip. So I would do a multitude of things for them. I would definitely have to identify the property to get them into. So that was the most important thing why they were coming to me because they don't, they're over in Canada. Sometimes they would come out, but like they're very into like what's a good area, what's a good pocket. So I would have to identify things and work with each one of them. And then I, I did project management of some, um, I did, eventually I started doing JVs with some of the Canadians on fix and flip. And that's another stream of income that I was making too, as, as we got deeper into uh, okay. partnerships, stuff like that. But again, so, partnerships. Right. You was just providing that resource for them. They were 
way north and you were here and they couldn't get to the property. So you said, hey, I'll be your eyes, your ears. I'll vet the deals, find the deals, and then we can partner on them. Or until you got to that point, you said, hey, here's your rental property. Get going. So, yeah. yeah. And, and shoot, like one of the guys I remember, Jed from Winnipeg, I'm still friends with him today. I picked up this nice property in Levine back then. It was a few years old and he got it for like 80 grand and he sold it for 185, not too long after, I think four years. And he ended up, I, I after I, he sold that, I put him into a multiplex, a four unit in uh, Phoenix. So like, it, it's, it was a win-win. And one of the things Jerry always taught me, uh, you always got to be honorable. Honor was pretty big with him. And like, if you say something, do it. And then if you screw up, just, yeah, yeah, it's like, I messed up, and, but I'm not going to hide from it. There you go. There you go. And then people, people are willing to accept that. If you come back to them and say, Hey, but I, I underwrote the property at X and it came in at Y. There was a mistake on my part. I know you have to eat the mistake, but I'm coming to you and telling you this is what happened. This is the reason why it came in this week and I, this this low. And I apologize. I take the brunt of the responsibility for it. People will still be willing to work with you because they understand that not everyone is perfect. Not everything is perfect. So guys, remember you're listening to this podcast. You got to build those partnerships. You got to network, get those right people on your team and really get out there and start finding those deals. That's basically what Phil is telling you. He started, had the money, lost it all, and then used his intellectual knowledge and intellectual capital to get back on his feet and get started. So Phil, after you did all of that with the Canadians, how did you get back into real estate real heavy? How were you finding deals? Because I know Phoenix is a very competitive market and it always have been competitive. So yeah, I mean, that's the thing. If you First of all, like my attitude is like Phoenix is gigantic. I came from a little small area in the Midwest. So like, all right. I mean, yeah, it's competitive, but so what? Like if you have that mindset, there's no more deals. I've been hearing that for 15 years. It's like, all right, <laughs> you're not going to get a deal if you don't think there's no more deals. Like there's always going to be deals. There's You just you got to uncover that next rock and, and, and meet that next person, meet that next realtor, just networking's big. So yeah, a lot of my deals over the years, Marcus, like I don't know much about like sending flyers. Like it's all been networking with realtors, like just relationships. That's so what, what are, what are some of the things that you would do Philip, for someone that's getting started and they say, hey, but I don't have the money for marketing. I'm just going to network. What do you think that they should do? What kind of, give me two or three things that they should do to really get out there and find the people that they need to, to have on their team. Yeah. I mean, one of the main things I would, I did for, for myself. So wholesalers, there, there's so many nowadays. So find wholesalers, take them out for coffee. Like, get to know them. I, I still feel strongly, even though they're blasting properties on internet, like if you're good to someone, they're going to bring you deals. So like get to know them on a personal level. That's, that's one thing. Get to know wholesalers. Realtors have been a giant source of a lot of my properties. They're like, Oh, why would realtors want to work? I'm like, they get both ends. So yep. And sometimes it's three times their money. So like that's work the realtor uh, market and you don't need a lot of realtors, but like you need realtors who understand the investment game, understand what to look for and close quick. If you tell that guy, you're going to take it, make sure you take it because it's not about that one deal. One deal turns into 10 deals. Like it's, it's, it's interesting and, and just do one with someone and then, see how you guys work together. And then like you said, Marcus, there's so many meetups nowadays, like get out there. Like I, I was a little hesitant to get out, but once I got out, I'm like, 
man, I, I met Brent Daniels, man. I mean, I know Brent for 12 years, man. I met, um, Jamil at a deal, man. I met this, like, so I've met a lot of guys yep. along the way coming up that like now they're killing it. And I mean, I'm not going to do that inside my house. I got to go to these meetup events and, and get to know people in the community. Absolutely. So guys, if you, if you're an introvert, and you want to be a real estate investor, you got to get over that flat out. You, you yeah. really have to get over that. You have to get out here to some of these meetups, some of these events and things like that. Use your RIA. I mean, use your RIA. If you're, you're right here in Phoenix, ASRIA, go to ASRIA.org, A-Z-R-E-I-A.org. Tons of events, tons of investors. I'm always there. I like working with them. Those guys are good. Anything that you need, I mean, believe me, it's at your it's at your RIA. I don't even think they charge that much at Azria, or sometimes it's free. Like, why wouldn't you go if you're brand new? Like, it's it's at night. Like, just just go learn if you really want to be an investor. Surround yourself, and they may meet you. They may meet this other guy, yep. and that's who you're doing deals with them. Yeah, I um just just talking about Azria. I was on on the Zoom meeting last night, and guys. Most of your RIAs are, are very affordable economically. Just, just as an example, I think ASRIA is less than 150 bucks for the year. Dang. I mean, Dang. that's less than 150 bucks for the year. So that's $10 a month. Let's just give or take. But you can meet so many high-level investors. I mean, yesterday, I met a guy from Tucson that's, that's scraping and building apartment complexes. And after the group, he reached out to me and was like, Hey, what we need to work together, see how we can have some kind of symbiotic relationship here doing deals. And I'm like, wow, okay. I always wanted to get into the building space. This is my opportunity. So just by getting out there and meeting people, everything that you need is right out there. Yeah. I mean, again, just show up and it's not about you. It's like, if you meet, you, you're going to learn one. That's why I always thought, told myself, like, I'll learn at least one thing and probably meet one or two folks that I'll continue a relationship with or have coffee with. Yeah. And, and when you're, and, and guys, when you're doing building rapport and meeting people, don't go out. Two things. Don't go out being a person who you're not. So if you haven't done a deal or maybe you only done five deals. Don't go out acting like you've done. You're the holy grail of real estate investors and you've done all of these deals. And then two, if you haven't done a deal, don't go and be shy and act like who's going to want to talk to me. You just have to go out there and let people know if you haven't done a deal, Hey, I'm new to real estate investing. I'm trying to learn if it's wholesale and fix and flip syndications, whatever. You just got to let people know what you're trying to do. And there is going to be someone there that can help you in some, some way, or you're going to learn something that you didn't know before. So you're, you're absolutely right, Philip. And the other thing I would add to that, Marcus, is if you're hungry enough, like go work for, offer your services free. I mean, like if that guy's doing 20 deals a year and you're doing zero, like, could you imagine how much you're going to learn from 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week, like run their coffee, whatever it is, every yep. investor needs help in some capacity. So as a younger guy with energy and, wanting to gain their knowledge that's invaluable just i mean how great would that be if someone came and said hey marcus we're gonna you know help you do some things for 20 hours a week and all i want is to be around you like that i think that's a great idea for some of these younger folks it is and that's what i try and tell people sometimes you just have to you have to sacrifice in the beginning and, and it'll work out on the back end yeah without a doubt because you can learn on YouTube and these videos, but like actually seeing you close a deal or me, like what goes into it. I mean, that's invaluable. Got it. You got it. So Philip, let's do, let's do one thing real quick. We're going to take a brief break. We're going to hear a word from our sponsors. And then when we're, when we come back, we want to pick up on you closing a thousand deals and your fix and flip business, and now your Airbnb short-term rental. So we'll be right back. We'll hear a word from our sponsors. 
PropString is the industry's number one tool for locating distressed properties and connecting with highly motivated sellers with 100% coverage across the U.S. PropString provides a deep dive into any property's specific details, making it easy to generate lists of distressed properties and contact to the owners. No other product or service can compare. Gain access to MLS property details like expired listings. You can pull accurate comps, even sale prices in non-disclosure states. This information is typically reserved for licensed real estate professionals, but is also available to you in PropStream. Gain access to unlimited nationwide property search, comparable home sales, targeted marketing lists, and owner contact lookup, built-in marketing tools, hundreds of filters to search and sort leads. Start your free seven-day trial now by going to proud.propstreampro.com slash we love it. All right, guys, we are back with the flip man, Philip Zweig from oh, here. God. Yep, from here in sunny Southwest Arizona, Phoenix, Chandler to be exact. Philip has closed over a thousand deals. He has done fix and flips, wholesales, Airbnb, rental property. So this guy has done a little bit of it all. He is, has a variety and we're going to talk to him right now about his fix and flip business because he's he's big on Instagram. What's your IG, Philip? Uh, at flipping underscore AZ. At flipping underscore AZ. Follow him on IG. Believe me, I do. He does a lot of great stuff on his social media platform. So Philip, tell me about some of these flips that you're doing right here in, in Arizona. Yeah. So interestingly enough, I everyone wants a home run. So like I would say the key in fix and flip Marcus is lock the deal in, lock it in, make sure you understand numbers. Once you lock in a contract, I could fix and flip, I could wholesale, I could rent, rent it out, I could turn it into Airbnb. So that's step number one is like, yeah, I want to do a fix and flip, but I, I, I need to lock it in at a good price. And then from that point, I have so many different options. So I'm not always like sold. I got to get this deal to fix and flip. It just depends where I'm at, what I'm doing. So interestingly enough, I ended up getting deals. I get deals from all over, but like. Wait, 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 stop. That's one of the things that I was going to ask you. How are you finding deals Right. Is it just through your network or how are you finding deals? Because a lot of people say that, well, my market is too competitive. I can't find any deals. Yeah. And, and again, understand, like, I'm not, I don't need a ton of deals. So if I do like this year, I, I've slowed a little bit on my fix and flips because I'm more focused on converting Airbnb business. But so say I do 10 fix and flips this year, that's a good number for 2021. I got a deal from a guy that's a friend of mine. It's in a little town called Kearney, Arizona, 2,000 people. So it's east of Globe. And I mean, I think I paid like 50 some thousand for it and it's probably worth 130. So, I mean, clearly the spread was there. I locked it in. I decided to keep it as a rental. I get twelve ninety five right now rent, so I, I put about ten into it. So he came to me with that, and then all of a sudden, someone else brought me a deal in Kearney. Now I have another deal in Kearney. Like it's interesting how the how things work. Yep. So I, I I bought another one, and actually it was on it was a thirteen hundred square foot home on about. A uh, half acre. So basically, it was two parcels. I'm like, all right, I'll either flip it or I'll I'll keep it. But so what I did, this was from a friend of mine here. She's a wholesaler, and it took literally like six, seven months to close that thing because there was a state and a lot of my title company really had to go to bat for me on that one. So anyway, what we did, we put about ten into it, but I ended up keeping the back half acre. And I am going to put some trailers back there and rent that out. I'm in escrow right now to sell the front house for, I'll probably make 45000 on that, on a flip. So 
that that was great because I only paid 50. Now I get to keep the back end of it, the, the separate lot, and I'm going to flip the house. So there's right. a lot of different strategies you could work. And again, all my property in Kearney has come from smaller wholesalers, people that have known me over the years and, hey, I'm working on this deal. Hey, I'm working on this deal. So yeah. And then again, realtors too bring me deals that, Oh, my, my landlord is, he just has this one place in Tempe and he's tired of being a landlord. How much will you give us for it? Let's go see it. And so stuff like that. Oh yeah. That's amazing. But, but again, it goes back to that power of network and guys, we, we can't harp it enough. And that's really what I'm going to, going to title this, this podcast is partnership and networking. How critical is it? And you're, you just said it, Philip one of the most competitive markets in the country and you're not doing any marketing. You're just finding deals because pre people are bringing them to you because of your network. And that's, that's awesome. That's, that's amazing. It, it's a blessing because again, I hadn't talked to Debbie for a long time. All of a sudden she brings me this. So it's interesting. And then another thing I did, I was working with a realtor and we had this software this was last year. So basically it scans the MLS and it kind of filters it down to home. So he was literally working for me every day with the software and we bought some properties through it off the MLS. So there's, mm. there's multiple strategies, but again, get yourself a handful of realtors. You may have to go through a hundred, 200, but get five, 10 really Realtors, they're out there every day. I mean, to me, it just made sense. There you go. There you go, guys. So you understand if you don't have the money, what you need to do, you need to get out there and network and partner with people. Even if you feel that you don't have anything to offer, you absolutely have something to offer. Philip told you, if you don't have any money, just find out what you can do to help that real estate investor. Hey, can I go and pick up stuff from Home Depot? Can I run some stuff over to the accountant? Can I drop off papers at the title company? Anything, anything, because you just want to make sure that you're immersed in the business and you're going to pick up tidbits along the way. And then that real estate investor field, correct me if I'm wrong, they're going to see, oh, this person, this guy or this gal, they're a hustler. They're going to get out there and do whatever they need to I mean, do. If they hustle and they're hungry, I mean, I don't care how smart they like we could teach them the rest, right? But you can't teach hunger or desire. Like I'm not going to wake you up at five in the morning or tell you you're going to sleep. Like you, you, you need to figure that part out. But I mean, if you got that, you got a lot. Yep. Yep. So, so you're big on mentorship, Philip. And, and since we've been going down this road, talking about partnership and the importance of having the right people in, in your network, how, critical is it for you do you think in order to have a mentor someone over you to show you the way and do you currently have a mentor i do and i i mean in all different areas of life so i i just like i knew early on like the power of time because like i could compress time like through jerry like he's he's 83 now or whatever so i he he had so much experience that I, I'm not going to read a book and pick it up. I'm going to pick his brain. Like we would go to coffee. We would go for sushi. Like every meeting, like every time we met, maybe it's not focused on the real estate, but we end up talking about this deal or that deal. And it, it just, yeah, it's that power of having someone compress all those years and just guide you because this isn't an easy game. I mean, there's, I mean, there's so much I don't even know. Like you want to get in a building like that, that's available, but like you got to go to this guy in Tucson who, who's done it before at a high level. I think that makes your life so much easier. Yep. Yep. You're right. You're right. So you just got to get around the people that have done it, that have blazed that trail already. I forgot the quote, but it says, if you want to learn something, you catch the person that's coming back. So if you're on the way, you catch the person that's coming back and you stop them and say, hey, I'm headed where you're, where you're coming from. How do I get there and how do I expedite the time? And that's the whole important piece about mentorship. It's not 
really to, it's not really just to pay for the proximity, but it's to learn and, and speed up that, that, that learning curve. So speed it, up, speed it up. Yeah. We only got so many hours, so many days. And why wouldn't I want like five, five years versus 20 years for me to try to figure out, like you already made that path. I may change it a little bit, but like you've already walked the path. Yep. Yep. So, so Philip, Talking about your Airbnb pivot, why did you decide to go that route? Okay, so I'm all about testing and seeing if it really works. So another power relationship, Sasha, a buddy of mine, he wholesaled me his first deal ever, didn't know a lick about real estate, 15 years ago, Westview, 71st Avenue, and... This was, like I said, 15 years ago. I bought that. I kept it, just sold it a few years back. But he became a luxury realtor in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So he does a lot of high-end properties now. And then he got into short-term rentals 10 years ago, believe it or not, a long time ago. Wow. So he, he wasn't even, yeah. he, he decided to give up wholesaling and he got into being a realtor, get his license, and then he got into the Airbnb VRBO space. And so he owns them in Palm Springs. He's Canadian. He owns them in Quebec. So him and I were having lunch. Let's see. I guess it was about 20. I mean, this shows you. I hadn't seen him in years. And so we were having lunch. And he's like, I got this deal. This was about a year and a half ago. He's got this listing. My doctor and the wife are getting a divorce. They've owned this Airbnb for eight years. You want to go take a look at it? I'm like, man, that, that'd be interesting. So this was over by the Sky Harbor Airport. We went to look. He's like, I need 189 for it. I'm like, man, I don't pay retail. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'll send you the financials. I'll send you the numbers the last eight years. And this was December 2019. And I'm like, all right, send it over. So I, I really took a strong look at it. I love what I saw as far as the cash every month that they were making. The expenses weren't too, too much. So the business was already set there. All the furnishings, I just needed to replace like a couch. Like all the decor was beautiful. They had super host status. And I decided to pull the trigger and at that, retail? That, yeah, he, he's tough. He wouldn't budge. He wouldn't budge on his commission. I'm like, that's fine. So I pulled the trigger, 189. I put like 40,000 down on it. So my payments weren't that low, or my payments were pretty low. And I closed January of last year. And like four days later, I had my first Airbnb guest. So Closing wow. less than a week later, someone comes from out of town or whatever. I'm like, holy cow, this this is pretty this nice. This works. So then we had the pandemic. I was gonna buy three more from that family that with the divorce, but I got a little skittish because I'm like, man, I don't know. Are people traveling? What's gonna right. happen? So I ended up there was two months there, I'd say, Marcus, where like I was a little scared about it. So I had a friend, she needed a place, ended up renting at market value is like twelve fifty. So I let her stay there for a couple months until it kind of cooled off. Left it. Yep. She, yeah. She stayed there. She loved it. And then after that, like it's I've had healthcare workers, I've had nurses. That place, I became a super host myself. Like we we're, were killing it at that first original one. And right now we're getting like $200 a night and it's it's been booked. Wow. Nothing too, it, it's not luxury. It's uh, built in the 60s. The community's nice. It's got big trees. It's clean. So how did you, so let me ask you this, Phil. When you, when you took over that property, did they provide you with the with the assets also, like the cleaning crew, the turn how to turn it over? Yeah, Sasha was he was a great again, 
role model to learn. He, he gave us the basics. My daughter actually helps me with it. She's, she's somewhat technology inclined. So he sat down with us. We trained like I don't know, I think we did three weekends, like three Saturdays, maybe two hours each Saturday. And just, he taught us how to download, how to, what to do and set us up pretty much for success because his systems are like, he's, he's 10 years in the game. So yeah, I, I don't do any of that though. So I have a 17 year old daughter, like she finally found that what dad does isn't boring, like fix and flip, like real estate. That's the most boring thing, dad, because she likes science and math. But as soon as I took around the Airbnb, she got excited. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I mean, that's and that's the key thing is to pass on what you do to your kids. Although she wasn't interested in, in the other niches, she found one and I was wisdom on your part to say, okay, well, if this is something that you like here, come on, let me show you how to do it. And you control this asset. And that's going to give her that, that bug, that itch on real estate. And then you, you got her once that happens. I know it's nice because now we can hang out and do things to, because it's, it's work related, but we're still hanging. And I got a second buddy, JM. Same thing. He's been in the game only three years, but like she wants to go to lunch with us and ask him questions. So it, it's been cool to uh, have that. Plus rely on these two friends of mine, mentors that kind of got me stepped in that space. But now it's all of me. Like, what am I going to do with it? Like, so my goal this year, Marcus, is to convert my rentals into short-term Airbnbs. I'm on number four right now. I already own the, the condo, the house. As tenants move out, I'm going to have eight for this year is my goal. And then in four years, I want to have at least 32 Airbnbs. And I feel it's very realistic, like it's eight per year. And uh, the cash flows, I, I did the numbers is, is crazy. Perfect. Perfect. So that's your goal is to have 32 cash flowing Airbnbs in the next, what did you say in the next uh, four years? Four years. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Well, you beat me to that question because my question was going to be, all right, what do you, what do you see in the future? So I'm going to pivot to this. Where do you see real estate at on the next, let's just say one, two, three years. Do you see a bubble? What do you see? Do you see it stabilizing? I mean, that's a great question. We're it's so amazing because I talk to guys all over the country and like the activity, like there's such a shortage right now on inventory. Arizona, I mean, holy cow, where we're at, like it's like historic lows. People yeah, we have less than 6,000 units, I believe, the last time I checked. Yeah. So like, my realtors I work with that are buying people homes and first time home buyers are relocating people like they're trying to get Chandler, Gilbert, Scottsdale, all that stuff is very competitive. I met someone at one of my recent pop-ups in Scottsdale. She came in from LA. She bought a place in Gilbert. They overpaid 40,000 to get wow. this, but it's a deal to her because she, she's coming from. Yeah. She's coming from LA. So I feel, I mean, look at the, the rates, the mortgages are incredibly low. The building's at an all-time high here in Arizona. I mean, I keep hearing about Goodyear, Goodyear. Like, that's far, but, like, stuff is pushing, like, all over. We're in a good space, I feel, for the next 10 years, I hope. Get this whole health situation, pandemic under control with the vaccines. And I'm pretty optimistic on what we're doing. Okay. Well, perfect. So, Phil, what we're going to do now... We're going to put you on a hot seat, man. We are going to put Phil on the hot seat. Phil, are you ready? Are you ready to get on the hot seat? All right. So starting out, what would you do differently if you would do anything differently? Differently, I would see the contractors work before committing because, again, that contractor is everything like I can't go in and do the popcorn and stuff like that. So go see a couple examples of their end product 
their work. In the beginning, I wouldn't do that. And sometimes it bites you in the butt. Okay. All right. So what is one characteristic you believe every high producing investor need to have? You see the energy, like energy show up and don't be like, if you're going to do it, you got to show up and show up with energy. Otherwise don't, don't do the job. Like don't, don't even come around me. Right. Like you got to show up to, to be there. There you go. There you go. Do you have any good book recommendations for someone getting started or if somebody is pivoting from corporate to real estate investing? I mean, as Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that's like a basic, that one. There's a game out we used to play. As you get more into it, there's a book my buddy Pace recommended, Rocket Fuel, um, okay. about the visionary, and then you need a connector. So building teams. Again, we could do this sole entrepreneur, or we could do this thing where you're working with another partner, you're, you're working with people under you. It just depends which way you want to go and what fits your lifestyle. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And then in parting, Philip, what words of encouragement would you give someone that's just getting started or again, on the fence, making that transition like you did from corporate to being a solopreneur or entrepreneur, what words of encouragement do you have for them? I would jump in. Don't look back. Like, make it your only option. That's what I did. Like, man, if this doesn't work, I, I got nothing else. Like, I, I'm not going back. So make sure you just, you can't stay on the fence. Like, either you're in or, you, like, jump in the water or, or don't do it at all, right? So, like, you're going to fail. You're going to mess up. But, like, stick with it and... Uh, Trust me that the, the results will, will be there if you stick. Don't don't quit. I, I feel like a lot of people are almost to succeed and then they'll throw the they'll quit. So that that's important. Let me and I'm gonna ask you this one other question. This just popped up in my mind as you were saying that. One of the reasons people don't get started is they say, Well, I don't have the money. How much of that statement is just an excuse and is that valid? I mean, I, I think there's some uh, fear behind it because I believe if you don't have the money, provide other values. So go figure out how to lock the deals up, lock them up. Then you, I mean, you don't need money to lock deals up. You need to get like a proof of funds from hard money lenders. Go find a deal. And from there, I mean, you create a business model plan, rental costs, whatever, and, and go. Money's easy, right? Like there's money all over. You got to change your mindset, I yep. feel. There's value that you could do if you're hungry. And that's, that's one of the things that I tell people. And that, sometimes they look at me crazy and they say, well, I just don't have the money. And I'm like, dude, money is everywhere. It's everywhere. And so guys, in order for you to find the money to do a deal, you need to listen to Philip and get out there and start networking and building rapport with people. Go to your RIA, go to your meetup groups, go to Philip's pop-ups. I flip man pop-ups. I don't know the name of the pop-up, but I just gave it one. <laughs> go go to the pop-ups, go to meetup.com. And there are opportunities out there for you. Do not let, I don't have the money stop you because there's deals where I didn't have the money. I mean, I'm, I'm working on run, one right now. I don't know where I'm going to get the money from on it, but I know it's a deal and I'm going to do it. Yeah. So get out there, you will find the money. You just got to use that energy in the right direction. So Phil, before we leave, man, how can we find you? How can, how can some of our great people of Arizona and across the country get in contact with you? You know, the best way, Mark, is on IG. I started that last year. So it's just at flipping underscore AZ. And go to my link tree. It's got everywhere they can find me, the YouTube. We do a... Arizona meetup where I have a guest, high level guest speaker every month. So go to at flippin underscore AZ and I always answer my DMs. I look at those and uh, every day I post something new. 
you'll you'll see a lot of my renovation journey because I'm converting the rentals and I have to renovate and they're going to see the Airbnb journey too. All right, guys. So you heard it right there. Go to Phillips IG and find him there and click on the link tree. And that way you can follow him on YouTube, also Instagram and in person also. So Philip, Flip, man, I want to appreciate you being on, man. It was my pleasure. It was a pleasure to have you on. You answered every question that needed to be answered, and you gave us a lot more. So I appreciate it. And guys, remember always to enjoy the journey. All right, guys, that was Philip Zweig from right here in Phoenix, Arizona. I haven't actually met Phil in person. But I've been following him for a while because we're we're in some of the same areas. He may be coming out of a title company and I may be going into one, things like that. We use some of the same resources. So just want you guys to know that you have to listen to what he said. And that was get out there and build a team. Even if you don't have everything that you need right now, the only way you're going to find it, the only way you're going to get it is to get out there and start networking with people in your market. So I understand you can find all of these national mentors and teachers and everything like that. Believe me, I'm not shunning them. I'm one of them. I try and help people across the country, but there's nothing like having that person in your own market that you can say, hey, let me run some properties for you. Let me pick up some things for you. Let me learn. Show me how to comp properties. Show me how to evaluate a deal, things like that. So you just have to get out there, guys. You have to get out there and learn and build report and find the people that you want to connect with because they're absolutely out there. So many times, real estate investors are always saying, man, I wish I had somebody to do X. I wish I had someone to do Y. And you're out there, but you're a little afraid to go and say, this is what I can offer. So I'm giving you the permission right now to go out, make a list of five or six people that you want to meet in your market and set it up. Go out there and meet them, okay? Don't just send an email. Find out where they're going to be at. If they host a meetup, go to the meetup. If they're in a RIA group, go to that RIA group. If they have an office, go to that office and say, hey, I'm just bringing Starbucks for you. I know you don't know me. I don't know you, but I follow you on Instagram. I follow you on YouTube or whatever. And that's how you start building those connections. It may be a little strange. They may not drink your Starbucks because they don't know who you are, but it's just the gesture. It's the gesture of saying, hey, I want to bring something to you because in return, I really want you to help me in this area, but I'm going to provide more value to you than you can imagine. So remember those those words, guys. It's Marcus Maloney, the Equity King, signing off. You guys know what to do. Always remember to enjoy the journey. Thank you for listening to today's show. I picked up some great actionable items and I'm sure you did as well. If so, let me know. You can always reach me via social media at facebook.com slash Maloney. Twitter at MRCS Maloney, and of course, IG at MRCS Maloney. You can also always reach me via email at mmaloney at equityri.com. Make sure you reach out to our guest as well. You can always find their contact information in the show notes below. If you have not subscribed already, what are you waiting for? Join the family. And while you're at it, leave us a five-star review. This is how we tell if we're providing you with what you need for your journey. If there's someone you would like for me to interview, or if there's a subject matter you would like for me to cover, please let me know. Finally, if you're looking for additional information about real estate investing, go to equityrealestateblog.com, also youtube.com slash Marcus Maloney. Until next time, family, always enjoy the journey.